Welcome to Leadership Thoughts Live, Resiliency During Times of Change. I'm Paul Danchek, Director of Executive Education for the University of Southern California Seoul Price School of Public Policy. Today is the fifth session of a six-part series. Thanks for joining us. If you're not able to join us last week for Meyer Ringler's session on resiliency in teams, be sure to check out the recording. Yesterday, we had to reset the previous video link, so be looking for the new one shared this afternoon. Today, we feature Ruben Brock on recharging. Next week, Anna Estrada Daniels will share insights on courage during times of change. Before introducing Ruben, a few housekeeping items. Sessions will be recorded and links sent out. Feel free to share the recordings with those within your networks. Enter all questions into the chat box. All participants will be muted for the duration of the lecture, except during the breakout session. Keeping with our approach over the last few weeks, today's session is designed to be interactive. We will have polling questions and one breakout session. The breakout will happen in the second half of the presentation. Many of you are familiar with the process. For those that haven't experienced it, when activated, the screen will shift and Zoom will take you into another room. You do not need to do anything. After the allotted time, it'll take you back to the main session. You will work with three or four others in addressing a posed question. We will share a reminder prompt of the question once you're in your rooms. Please take a moment to introduce yourselves. After discussing the question, identify one person to report back in the chat feature. If you have the ability to do so, share both audio and video. This helps facilitate the community of learning. Now onto our main event. With over 20 years in the behavioral health field, Dr. Ruben Brock is a professor of psychology at California University of Pennsylvania. That's right, he's an East Coast boy. <laughs> now lecturing, he has his own private practice, is a web show host for House Call with Dr. Ruben Brock and an author. We're glad to have him as part of our executive education team. Did I mention he plays a mean game of golf? Ruben, how should we be thinking about recharging under times of individual and organizational stress? Yeah, thanks, Paul. I appreciate that introduction. Uh, so my, my task today is to talk to you about how to recharge. Uh, and so my, like, like Paul said, I'm in private practice. And so um, my focus it tends to be for an individual to, to learn how to recharge and, and get themselves back to a good place uh, when things go wrong. Uh, but my goal for today is gonna be to one, first teach you why it's important to be able to do that. I'm gonna teach you what happens uh, when you're in a time of stress and, and why it's important to make sure we get back to a place of, of calm. But I'm also gonna help you identify, we're gonna begin to identify your your actual coping skills. And so it's important to me that you remember throughout this thing to apply this thing to yourself. So there are gonna be times when I prompt you to answer questions and, and that's really designed to make it so that you're not thinking globally, you're thinking individually for a minute. Uh, and I'm gonna hopefully teach you to adjust the way you think about stressful situations. And I'm gonna help you apply these things, these ideas to your leadership skills. My understanding is that many of you are leaders in your industries. And so we can apply these tools and techniques to the team that you lead. Uh, and it, I believe it will help you create a, a healthy culture among the people uh, that you're leading or the team that you work with. And then also, if we have time, I'd love to answer any questions you have, again, my job day in and day out is helping people adjust to situations that come up, whether it's a global pandemic or a crisis at home. Uh, and so that's my hope for today and, and I'll get started. So the first thing that we wanna do is understand exactly why it is that recharging is important. So um, the slide here shows you uh, that essentially when your mind perceives a stressor, any stressor. Again, it could be a pandemic. It could be a dog running toward you while you're walking home from uh, the store. Your mind signals to your body to go into what we call fight or flight, or the stress. this is called the stress response. So your mind sends a message and, and neurotransmitters are sent through your body and it prepares your body uh, for whatever you're gonna do, what you're gonna fight, you're gonna flee. Now, it's important that you understand some of the, the anatomy and physiology of this thing, and I'll explain why in a little bit. But your stress response happens right here in the autonomic nervous system. And, and so uh, the autonomic nervous system has two parts. 
the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And, and you might think to yourself, why does that matter? And, and it, it'll make sense in two seconds. So the sympathetic nervous system is the part of your nervous system that kicks in fight or flight. So it is going to kick in the stress response. It is going to kick in the stress hormones and we'll, we'll get there the stress hormones and, and prepares your body. And then the parasympathetic nervous system is the one that brings you back down. So sympathetic is gonna kick in fight or flight. Parasympathetic is gonna bring you back to homeostasis. Homeostasis is that state of calm that all organisms want to and strive to be in. And so naturally the human body wants to be in that calm state. Now, the interesting thing about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system is that they have this relationship that we call reciprocal inhibition. And what that means is that when one is on, the other cannot be on. Um, it's, think of it like a toggle switch. It, it's either on or it's off. Um, there's no dimmer on your autonomic nervous system. You, you're either on or you're off. Uh, and, and that's going to matter because if you understand that your parasympathetic nervous system turns off your sympathetic nervous system, there's a lot of power in that information. And, and we're gonna talk about how to use that power. So the stress response itself is the release of epinephrine, norepinephrine. So adrenaline, most people know the, the term adrenaline uh, or noradrenaline. Uh, and you're also gonna see increased blood sugar, uh, constricted blood vessels, increased blood flow, increase heart rate. Those are things that are all wonderful if you're about to fight a bear. Uh, if you are about to do something where your body needs to be keyed up, um, the stress response is really, really helpful and very, very important. Uh, but think of it, so the illustration there is, uh, is your RPMs on a car. So imagine you're sitting in your car and you put your foot on, the, you're, you're in park, you put your foot on the gas, you're revving up the engine. Your engine rev revs up and that's great if you're about to be in a street race and you really need your car to be going very, very fast for a few minutes. But as anyone who works with car, I'm a terrible car person. I'm very hard on cars. I've, I've blown up a car or two in my day. Um, and, and so what you need to understand yeah, it's is- It's gonna take me a long time if, and I'm- What you need to understand is that you don't want your car to be revving up all the time. In other words, you wouldn't want to put your foot on the gas and leave it there indefinitely. And so if you think about a time of prolonged stress, or if you think about chronic stressors, things that regularly happen and keep you in a state of stress, it's just like leaving your car revved up all the time. Eventually, that's going to cause you some problems. The human body, just like a car engine, and probably in fact more so than a car engine, the human body is not designed to maintain a state of stress long-term. If you are in a state of stress long-term, uh, you're gonna run into some problems. And, and so what you see here is a list of some of the things that are impacted by stress. Um, there, is, there is quite a bit of research in the field of psychoneuroimmunology about the impact of stress on your body. So what we know is that when you are in a state of stress for any long period of time or, or you're constantly feeling stressed, what happens is that your body gets fatigued. And so that, that fatigue actually works to break down your immune system. And from there, it's pretty simple to understand. Your, your immune system breaks down, you're gonna get sick more, uh, you're going to have headaches, you're going to have high blood pressure, all these things happen, and they are all uh, either caused or exacerbated by stress. And so if you look at that list, uh, there's, there's quite a bit of research about issues that, let's say you already have uh, hypertension. Well, stress is going to be one of the first things that your doctor asks you to reduce, uh, because your body can't handle it. And so this is kind of a picture of what happens if you don't know how to bring yourself back down. And, and so the, the thing to think about here is everyone deals with stress. Everyone is going to experience some level of stress on a daily basis because that's life. But what's important is how quickly you can get yourself from that revved up position to coming back down. So you want to get your body from, you know, foots all the way down on the gas 
to now you're at a nice comfortable idle. That nice comfortable idle is totally healthy. That is homeostasis. And when your car is performing optimally, you can idle and it sounds good and it, there's no strain on the car. Uh, if you are in a constant state of stress, uh, it, it's gonna run into problems just like a car. It will break down eventually. Your body will do the same, okay? And so my goal here is to teach you how to reduce the amount of time that you are spending revved up, okay? Uh, I know we call it recharging, but if we stick to the analogy of the car engine and either revving it up or letting it calm down, uh, there are two ways to reduce the amount of time that you are revved up, right? One is to learn how to take your foot off the gas. That's, that's easy. Right, learning how to take your foot off the gas. My, I think my dog just walked in the room. Um, but learning how to take your foot off the gas is one thing, but also it's important to learn how to be less likely to put your foot on the gas. And so uh, I'm gonna help you adjust. You, I'm gonna help you identify the skills that help you take your foot off the gas, but I'm also gonna help you adjust your thinking uh, so that less of the time your foot will even be on the gas, okay? Uh, so that's the goal for the next few minutes. So this whole idea of taking your foot off the gas or, or recharging your battery, it's all about what we call coping strategies or coping skills. And, and any of you out there who are parents know you have probably said to your child, you know, okay, we gotta use your coping skills. Uh, we say, you know, educators say this all the time, if you're, particularly if you work with young people. Um, and, and so you, you want to understand a couple of things. One, there are two different kinds of cope, right? There is problem-focused cope, which is actually addressing whatever the stressor is. So imagine, uh, let's say before this presentation, I, I was hit with a bunch of stress because I realized that I was, you know, I didn't have the slides in front of me. Maybe, maybe I had the wrong thumb drive or something like that. It, it hit me with some stress. Well, the simplest coping strategy there would be to go get the right slides and put it in quickly, right? And, and that would probably reduce or eliminate the stress, okay? Um, but the flip side of that is the emotion-focused coping, which is those techniques and skills that are, quite frankly, very, very popular right now, uh, the things that you do intentionally to bring yourself back down, bring yourself to a state of calm. And, and so when we're talking about that, the first one I always want to mention is breathing. Um, you could, I could make my bread and butter off of teaching people to breathe. Uh, it is by far the most important, uh, most crucial skill with respect to coping. Because if you think about what I said about uh, the, the nervous system, right? The sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So when your stress response kicks in, uh, your brain has sent a message to your body that says we are in a state of stress. But if you are breathing deeply, nice, calm, deep breaths, uh, similar to what you would do during yoga, during meditation, you are essentially sending the message, no, nope, no, nope, we're totally fine because Think about it. You wouldn't be sitting breathing deeply and nice and calm if a bear was charging after you, right? And, and so when you are sitting there breathing deeply, what you are essentially doing is attempting to convince your nervous system that there is in fact not a stressor or that the stressor is at least manageable, okay? So the first thing I want you to understand is breathing and think about breathing techniques. For those of you who have not ever uh, done any kind of a deep dive into breathing, uh, what I would encourage you to do is just go onto YouTube or buy an app or, or anything along those lines. There are a million different ways that you can learn deep breathing. And, and the cool thing about that is to learn to breathe properly. I always do an exercise with my students uh, about breathing and they always laugh when I tell them you're breathing wrong. But a nice deep diaphragmatic breath is going to be a breath that, so if I'll, I'll do a demonstration for you. Uh, most people, if they've not learned to breathe, are breathing from their chest. I, I really don't think I can get myself to breathe from my chest. But a nice deep diaphragmatic breath is actually going to push my, you can't see my stomach, uh, but I'm going to push my stomach out instead of my chest because the breath is coming from deep in my diaphragm. 
and and that is actually a much fuller much deeper breath and doing that again sends a message on a physiological level you are telling your body we are not in a state of stress because again you cannot be in a state of stress and in a state of calm at the same time okay so so things like meditation uh visualization yoga reading you know taking walks doing tai chi uh working out these are all the things that are sort of the cliche everybody knows to do those things but for a second what i want you to do is think about yourself okay um and and think about what you actually do to calm down. And, and when you do that, when, when, before I ask you that question, I'm gonna challenge you to remember this thing here, this reciprocal inhibition. So uh, if you are in a state of stress, you cannot be in a state of calm and vice versa. So if you say you are doing something to calm yourself down and that thing doesn't make you calm, it is not helping you, right? Does that make sense? sense in other words i'll give you an example so my latest obsession paul mentioned it is golfing and any one of you out there who has done any kind of golfing will know that for many people golf can be quite frustrating and so if i were the type of person who were stressing out about my golf score stressing out about my golf swing and i spent three hours out there angry it actually wouldn't be a good coping strategy because if i am stressed for most of the time when i'm out there i haven't brought myself to homeostasis right uh, and so that's something important to remember if you call it your coping strategy it's gonna need to be something that brings you to a state of calm so for me uh if i go fishing I don't care what the problem is. I don't care what's going on in my life. If I go fishing an hour or two out in a stream, out in the woods, and I will forget whatever the problem was. Uh, I will literally feel completely calm and relaxed. Um, and, and so the other one for me is golf. And, and another one that I tend to like is uh, sitting, relaxing and smoking a cigar. And what I like about smoking a cigar, because normally I would actually say substances are not a good idea, and I'll tell you why. Uh, but what I like about a cigar is that if you smoke good cigars, you know, I'll, I'll smoke a, a pretty solid cigar, and it'll be a good two hours that I have to be sitting there. And what I do is I force myself to turn off my phone, to put all my, my work away, and I sit and relax. And the only thing that I'm worried about in that moment is being relaxed. And that's the key. That's why it brings me to homeostasis. Because if you're anything like me and you work a lot, I tend to, even if I say I'm relaxing, I've got my phone or I've got my laptop and I'm checking emails and I'm thinking about my to-do list and the stuff that, that you know, I need to do for work and the stuff that my mom or my wife wants me to do. My mom, my mom probably wants me to do something too. Uh, and, and so that is not always necessarily going to be relaxing. And so uh, I want you to take a second and, and just put into the, the chat, you're going to put in what you do. What are your coping strategies? Uh, and I'm going to have Paul give me some, some highlights from what you put in there. But just take a second and, and tell me what you actually do to get yourself to a nice state of calm. So Ruben, Kaizamba is one. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, Pilates, walking, surfing, painting. I must have some California people out here to go surfing. Uh, yes. Things that you would expect, running, exercise, um, hot tub, um, singing in the hot tub, walking dog, deep breathing, hanging with friends, bicycling. Yeah, th so those are great. I wanna, I wanna highlight a couple. Uh, painting, that's a really cool thing. And, and the reason it's really cool is the same reason that golf can be helpful. Anything that makes you focus is really, really gonna be helpful. The reason for that, if you are focused, it, when I, I'm a terrible golfer, so when I'm golfing, I really have to focus on doing the right stuff in order to get my swing where, where it's gonna be or else the golf ball's gonna be out in the woods somewhere. And because I'm focused on the golf part, I can't be focused on that presentation that I need to get done. I can't be focused on the argument my wife and I had yesterday. I can't be focused on the fact that there's a global pandemic. 
Um, and so what you want to do is find something that distracts you from the stressor. Because believe it or not, it's not that the stressor is going to go away. The stressor still exists, but it's your perception of the stressors that is going to impact how you respond to them. And so uh, I like the painting idea. I also like the hot tub idea. People sometimes miss how therapeutic sitting in water can be. Uh, anyone, I know the folks, folks that are out in California and, and who love water probably know this full well. Um, but about a year ago, I bought a hot tub for this very reason. I wanted to be able to sit and relax and I regularly do it. Um, believe it or not, I have to force myself sometimes to take the 15 minutes and go sit in my hot tub. Uh, but when I do, I'm always reminded of why I did it, why I bought it, because it is really, really calming to be in water. Um, and, and so I heard a lot of uh, a lot of the sort of the normal stuff that you would expect, like um, like walking and working out and stuff like that. And all those things are perfect. Uh, but what I want to challenge you to remember is again that that nervous system piece, right? If you're sympathetic nervous system is on, your parasympathetic nervous system is off. Your parasympathetic nervous system is what keeps you calm and brings you back to homeostasis. So you're going to want to find something that turns on your parasympathetic nervous system or kicks in your state of calm, because even if it's temporary, even if it's for an hour, you are in a state of calm. And that is what recharges your battery. That is that is what the that's the purpose and the importance of coming back down to homeostasis. It allows your body to recharge and not end up in fatigue. So thanks, Paul. I appreciate it. Uh, <clears throat> so the other thing that can be helpful about uh, managing stress, recharging, uh, is learning to not get so stressed, right? So, so it's obviously important to learn how to take your foot off the gas. But it's important also to learn to see the world in such a way that you're not always putting your foot on the gas. And so the, the next couple of constructs that I'm going to talk about are things that you can do or ways that you can see the world um, that allow you to not feel so stressed. And, and I believe that this is actually going to be building upon information you got in a previous, uh, previous presentation about the idea of locus of control. So your locus of control is essentially what you attribute things to. In other words, if I believe that the world is something that is outside of my control, I have an external locus of control, right? I believe that the world happens to me. And if the world happens to me, when something bad happens, I believe that it is controlled by the outside world and there's not much I can do to change it. And, and the problem with that line of thinking is that it creates this feeling of helplessness, right? So as you think about and hear about this, I want you to think about your current situation, your, your, your daily life, maybe even this virus. How do you think about it? Do you think about it in terms of the things that you can control and the idea that you are able to manipulate the world around you? Or do you think of it in terms of, that this is going to happen and you're just sort of along for the ride. If you have an external locus of control, you can tend to feel helpless, hopeless, uh, and even dependent because you will be dependent on whatever it is you believe is in control of the situation you're in. Uh, and, and also with an external locus of control, you tend to be reactionary, right? Because you're not the driver of this bus. And so you're going to wait and see what happens and you're going to react to it that is going to give you significantly more stress than if you have an internal locus of control. An internal locus of control means that I believe that I'm sort of the master of my fate. And so if something bad happens, if a stressful situation presents itself and I have an internal locus of control, I'm going to have a fundamental belief in my ability to do the things that will get me out of that situation. It makes it so that I can be proactive uh, and I can be solution focused. So, so when, when crisis hits, I can immediately say, okay, what do I do? Because my ability to get out of this is dependent on my actions, right? That is an internal struggle 
for an internal locus of control. And, and what I like to point out with this one is the serenity prayer. And, and I am by no, no means a religious person, but I have found through my work with the drug and alcohol community, and, and particularly the recovery community, that the, that the serenity prayer is actually something that can, can be very, very helpful to everyone, whether you're in recovery or not, whether you're a religious person or not. And so if you've never heard it, I'll give it to you. The serenity prayer goes like this, and you really can't, if you need to, want to remove the God part from it. But it says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the strength to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And so basically the idea here is, and I teach this to my clients regularly, there's probably not a two week period that goes by where I don't recite that prayer to some client and say to them essentially, this is about putting everything in life into two boxes, okay? Everything that you see, all, all the stuff that comes into your life, you're gonna put it into two boxes. The stuff that I can control and the stuff that I can't control. If it goes into this box, the stuff that I can control, then I need to rise to the occasion. I need to do whatever it is that I need to do to fix it. I've got to do my, my part, right? So if I'm looking at this COVID-19, I can control how often I leave my house, how often I put myself at risk by exposing myself to outside germs, right? So that means I, me and my family, we're going to be in the house 99% of the time. If we have to go to the grocery store, we try to make it one big grocery run and we, and we don't go, you know, in my old life before we were in quarantine, we would, we would literally, because we like fresh food, we would go to the fresh market every couple days, right? But today, because of COVID-19, I'm going to go to the grocery store and I'm going to try to get two weeks worth of food so I don't have to leave the house. That is something I can control. On the flip side of that, I can't control what the neighbor does, right? There's nothing I can do about the fact that this is the truth. This is, I'm not exaggerating. My neighbor actually literally, he has, they have parties next door. All the, I don't know why. I guess they just don't care about Corona, but, but they, they have a bunch of teenager, uh, teenagers there and they're partying, they're hanging out, they're doing stuff. And, and so I might think to myself, they're bringing in more risk because there are people, there's traffic, there's all this stuff right? But I can't control that. Short of going over and beating up my neighbor, there's nothing I can do to stop what they are doing, right? So, so that means it goes in that other box. It goes in that cannot control box. And that means I've got to leave it alone. I've got to let it go. That is not a problem that I can fix. It is something that is in the world that I have to accept, right? And so the serenity or the peace comes from understanding that I've reduced my workload by half by saying the stuff that I can control, I'm going to worry about it. But the stuff that I can't control, I'm going to letter, literally put it off to the side and I'm not going to touch it because I can't control it. And the important thing to remember is because I can hear someone out there saying, yeah, but that doesn't mean the problem is gone. And you're right. That doesn't mean that the problem is gone. But what it means is it's a recognition of the fact that the problem is there. And whether you worry about it or not, it'll still be there you worrying about it doesn't actually change it. The only thing that you worrying about it does is put your body in fight or flight, right? And we know what flight or flight, fight or flight does to our bodies. So you're putting the gas pedal on and there's absolutely nowhere for you to go. Does that, so so the, the idea of this is if the stuff, if I put it in that box, I cannot control it, then I just need to leave it alone. Okay, uh, so that's the internal and external locus of control. So I'll, I'll give you a couple of seconds. There's now a poll question. And, and so I'll, I'll read the poll question. Uh, in your daily life, do you tend to work from an internal or an external lo locus of control? So you can answer that question. And then the other piece, this is the beginning of my planting seeds for you about the fact that these individual skills are transferable to your, your work life, your leadership skills. Do you believe that you foster an internal or external locus of, locus of control within your team? So those are two questions. Which one do you do and which one do you believe is the culture that you foster in your work environment? So Ruben, the numbers are coming in. We'll give it a second. Yes. I love it. I, I, I see 
internal locus of control is winning the battle right now, which is a good thing. Um, and I, I'll let you all ponder this question. Uh, and, and what I'll say is I'll challenge you to think about, I'll challenge you to think about when you are in a work situation and, and how you foster this belief in culture. And we're gonna talk more about this in a second, but um, your style, your style in your life. So for, I'll use myself as an example. And if I say I'm the leader of my family, maybe my wife would come and punch me for saying that. But, but let's say hypothetically that I'm the leader of my family. My attitude, the way I approach this thing is really gonna dictate the temperature and the, and the culture in my house, right? If I'm running, running around, like what's the, I, what's the character's name? Is it um, Chicken Little or something like that? The one that was yelling about the, the, the sky falling? There, there's, there's some book about the, the sky falling and someone running around saying, that, saying you know, doom is, is happening, doom is coming. If I run around saying, oh my goodness, this is terrible, uh, we're all gonna die, then everyone in my family is gonna kind of feel that way right? And, and they're going to feel like it's going to be really, really bad. But if I am presenting the idea that everything is going to be okay, and that we need to take the steps so that we can be okay, I'm actually fostering or instilling uh, a, an attitude of, of an internal locus of control. And it looks like, yeah, so we've got, uh, we've got most people acknowledging an internal locus of control and a few people, 13%, in their personal life and 11 percent in their <clears throat> in their work life saying that they believe they are using an external locus of control and it's good to recognize that you do that now uh, it's not ruben, helpful ruben if i can chime in just for a second because our Please? viewers are on the recording won't be able to see it um 89 percent ah. roughly for both questions said um internal so um largely Thank focused you. on internal locus control and fostering an environment that's more internal focused, also the same percentage, 89%. Okay, perfect. And, and I'm glad you said that. I don't know what they see whenever I'm looking at that. I could see the results. So, um, so yes, but, but it's important that you, that you recognize your locus of control or the way that you see these things. Uh, and, and the reason it's important is that although some people would call this a personality trait, right? Some would say that you are hardwired this way. The minute you begin to think about it, you can introduce a new way of thinking into the equation. So you are not necessarily doomed to an external locus of control if that is what you tend to do right now. You can work on adapting your, your thinking. And so you can learn to work from an internal locus of control. And there's a body of research that suggests that that literally will reduce the amount of time you you spend being stressed because if i believe that i can control the things that come into my life i worry less about them and and so if you think about it uh, i always use the example think about a four-year-old if you have a if you have a child or you have uh, a niece or nephew uh, or you've ever been around a very little kid and you take that child to get some ice cream and the four-year-old drops their ice cream cone. The four-year-old is gonna freak out, fall on the floor, scream and cry. It's gonna be the biggest, most stressful problem in their life ever. Why? Because for them, there, there is no internal control over whether they have ice cream or not, right? And so for them, this, my ice cream is gone, this is awful. Once you learn, once you've been through a few things and you realize, oh wait, I can just get another ice cream cone. Now, all of a sudden, that doesn't even feel like a stressful event. You might drop your ice cream and be upset if it was good ice cream and you don't want to buy another one. But you also recognize, well, theoretically, I could just buy another ice cream cone. So I'll, I'll clean up this ice cream. It's not really that big of a deal. Okay. Um, and so as you learn to manage stressors and you gain this internal locus of control, it actually reduces the amount of stress you feel daily. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, and then the last piece that I want to give you from kind of a theoretical perspective is the idea, uh, it comes from positive psychology, and it's this idea of a sense of coherence. This is 
uh, a psychological construct that has been studied and it, and it was first studied, they were talking about and looking at Holocaust survivors, okay? So people who lived through Nazi Germany. And what they found was that those folks, the ones who survived, actually show significant resilience. And, and in fact, they show better health outcomes than one might expect in, from a person like that who has been through such traumatic experiences. And what they found is that this, this construct sense of coherence uh, is actually correlated uh, with these good results. And so it breaks down into a few different constructs. Comprehensibility, and, and so I'll just tell you what these things mean. Uh, so the idea of comprehensibility is your ability to understand and recognize your own abilities. So, so I understand what I'm good at. I understand my deficits, right? I can comprehend what my tools are. Okay, and then manageability is the idea that I believe that my abilities and my skills will be enough to manage whatever comes my way. So in other words, if, I'm, if I know that I have decent communication skills, I know that I'm, I'm, I happen to be trained in Kung Fu, right? So that means when I'm walking around, maybe even at night in a sketchy place, I'm actually still relatively calm because I believe even if something bad, some, someone jumps out of the corner and wants to attack me, I believe I would probably either talk them down and, and kind of defuse the situation or pull out my training. Either way, I'm probably going to be okay. That gives me, whether I'm right or wrong, if I believe that, I actually feel more calm. I feel less stressed. Okay, and then the idea of meaningfulness, and this is going to be a big one, and we'll talk about this a little bit. Uh, meaningfulness is the idea that a person believes that life is worth living, and that even though there will be struggles and difficulties, uh, that, that they should continue to go through it, right? And so there are people who are, are hopeless, and, and hopeless people, you will find the research is very, very clear hopeless people have all kinds of negative psychological and physical outcomes. Uh, but people who have hope and believe that there is a purpose to life tend to bounce back much, much faster, okay? Uh, and so, so this idea of sense of coherence, it is both a, a character trait, like it's a personality trait, but it's also a coping style. And so again, this is something you can learn to adapt, right? So, so as you think about and chew on and gain insight into these ideas, you can introduce this as a coping style, as a coping strategy, this belief in yourself, this understanding of your own abilities. Uh, and this actually will reduce the amount of time you spend feeling super stressed out. Okay. Uh, and, and so you might ask yourself, okay, well, how, how do I implement that? If I tend to be a very, very negative person, how do I implement that? And, and you do that by finding the positives, right? By finding hope. You can always, uh, in my world, we, we talk about reframing a lot. Most of the time, when a person is feeling gloom and doom, it is because they are probably using a few cognitive distortions, uh, one of them being like catastrophizing or all or nothing thinking. So in other words, the coronavirus is here, everybody's gonna die. Well, chances are that's not true. Everyone isn't going to die. That is just not likely to be the case. And so my ability to understand that I do have a chance to be okay and I could do the stuff that would, it would take to be okay, that makes me feel better about the situation as opposed to feeling like there's nothing I can do, everybody's gonna die. That's very hopeless. I'm gonna sit in my house and stress out until I have a heart attack. Corona won't kill me, my heart attack will, okay? Um, and so you want to be able to find ways to reframe situations. Uh, as, as a clinician, uh, I believe in my ability to reframe just about any, any problem. Uh, and so no matter what happens to you in life, if you talk to me for five minutes, chances are I could find for you a way to look at this as a positive. And, and a good example that I find right now is I'm home. I've been home for the past month. Probably you've been home for the past month as well but I'm a very, very busy person. I work a lot. 
and this virus and the quarantine has forced me to be at home with my family. And I actually like my family. I'm quite fond of my wife. I'm quite fond of my children. And so right now I'm getting more quality time with my family than I've ever had in the past. And so while this virus is bad, and while the situation is relatively stressful, it is not all bad for me. I'm actually enjoying the quarantine. And my wife and I talk all the time about how I actually will miss it. I'll miss, I'll miss being home with the family whenever we go back to work. And that's a reframe. So, so I now see this as a cool thing. I get to practice golf in my backyard. I get to see my family all the time. I get to do my, my work in my pajamas. You can't see I have pajama pants on right now. And, and that is a very cool thing to be able to do. And believe it or not, focusing on that makes this virus and this quarantine feel less stressful for me, okay? Um, and if you really want to do a deep dive into restructuring your mind in that way, I highly suggest that, that book that's at the bottom of that slide, Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, that is a book by Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a psychiatrist who lived through the Holocaust. He was in the internment camps and he wrote the book about that experience. And I don't wanna give the book away, but essentially what happens is through this period, he goes into despair, but then he figures out that he has to choose to either be in despair or not be in despair. And, and he essentially figures out that one can choose to see things in any way that they wanna see them. So you could be in the middle of uh, a concentration camp and you could choose to find meaning in it. And for Viktor Frankl, it was, you can't stop me from helping people. So the people around me, I'm gonna help them. That brings me meaning in my life. You can't take that away from me. You can put me in a concentration camp, but you can't take away the meaning of my life. I do the things that I do. I show up the way I show up. Um, and, and believe it or not, focusing on that allows you to not feel quite as stressed. Does the stress go away completely? No. but it does allow you to feel less of that stress, okay? Ruben, uh, Ruben before yes. you move on, can you go back to what comprehensibility is? Comprehensibility, yes. So comprehensibility is my ability to comprehend both my skills and my weaknesses. So it's about whether or not I have an accurate understanding of my skill set. And, and the reason that's important is, is if I know my skill set, I know what tools to use to get me through a struggle, right? And so I, I like to use the analogy of the carpenter or the plumber, right? If, if I know that I'm a carpenter, probably I'm gonna pull out my hammer and my saw far more than I'm gonna pull out the wrench. And the, and the plumber is gonna pull out his wrench far more often because they know what they're good at. And, and so it's the ability to really understand uh, your abilities and your, short, your shortcomings uh, because what you find is that people who believe in gloom and doom, they don't recognize the power that they have. And, and, and so the problem there is if you don't recognize your skills, you're not going to bring your skills to the table in a time of stress. Okay. Great, thank you. Was that helpful? Yes, okay. thank you. Sure. And, and so before I challenge you with a question, I'm going to put up here, if those of you who don't recognize or you, don't, you didn't have kids at this time, uh, this is a slide from Remember the Titans. It's a Disney movie um, and, and it's a really cool movie. So, so watch it if you have a second. But there's, a, there's an interesting moment in this movie where these two football players who uh, feel like they're on, they're, they're on opposite sides, even though they are on the same team, uh, one of them is attempting to hold the other accountable for essentially not being a very good teammate. And, and the, the guy says, attitude reflects leadership captain uh, because one of these guys is the captain and wasn't leading his team. In other words, he was not creating an atmosphere that led to teammates performing optimally. And so my challenge to you is for you to think about that. You as a leader, are you bringing optimism or pessimism to the table? And so there's a set of questions that I want you to break out into your groups and, and think about, chew on, uh, I think we're going to give you something like five to seven minutes uh, to chew on those questions. And I, I believe, Paul, they're going to, or is it, is it Daniel, they're going to see these questions. Is that right? Yeah, we'll, we'll post the questions when, once you're in your breakout room. So um, you have a chance to go through them individually. 
Okay, so I'll give you a few minutes, go into the, into the small groups, chat about this, and you're gonna choose someone to report back, and then, and then uh, Paul will report to me what you guys have said, what you found, uh, and then we're gonna, we're gonna bring it back, wrap it all up, and I'll try to process this a little bit for you. Do you want to read the questions real quick, Ruben, before yes. they go in, and then I'll, and then I'll post it? Yes. All right. So the question you're going to be asking is, uh, consider our current situation with respect to COVID-19. Uh, what's the atmosphere among your team or your department? What have you done to promote that atmosphere? And what would you hope to change, if anything? So maybe you think you're doing it great, you're knocking it out of the park, and that's wonderful. But if there's something to change, what would it be? Uh, thank you so much. I, I hope you guys had uh, some degree of conversation um, while you're in that group and were able to reflect on on those questions. And I did see one comment in the chat, but I'll, I'm going to wait and see. Paul, did, did they report to you uh, anything that we could chew on? Myra, I see yours is pretty comprehensive. You're the scribe. Would you like to share some insights from your group? Sure. Yeah, we um, had a really good conversation about what some of the things that were working and that first and foremost was about creating a sense of safety at all levels. And so from, from the top, so this um, woman is responsible for a very large uh, organization. And so making sure that her direct reports know that, and then it's getting cascaded down this idea of feeling safe and secure. Yeah. Also, the um, idea of really communicating and setting boundaries about what current constraints are. So being clear about, I, I have to go do this distance learning thing with my child at two. Like, it, it can't be stopped. So those were a couple of the ideas. And then the idea of self-care. And you talked about this a bit, Ruben, but just how important that concept or idea of self-care is during this right. time. Yeah, that, that's really cool. And the, the thing that I'm going to highlight and that I like about it is that you are absolutely right that it is a top-down approach. So if, if it is communicated from the top that this is a safe environment, that, um, that we are approaching this thing in a proactive way, it feels totally different than if you see your boss running around with their, you know, like a chicken with their head cut off. That just feels stressful. And, and so, like for myself, I work at a university and, and I don't know about your institution, but in, in the beginning of this whole thing, in my institution, it felt very frantic. When we were figuring out this whole, this quarantine, it, it felt very much like the people at the top had no idea what they were doing. Um, and, and some would argue, even on a national scale, I don't wanna get into politics, but, but there are some who say, this feels very frantic because it's not clear that the people at the very top know really what to do, um, which is maybe an unfair statement because we haven't had a situation like this for like 100 years. So, so it'd be tough to know what to do. But yes, it is definitely a top down kind of thing. You can set the tone and let people know we're going to be OK and, and here's why, it, just by the way you approach it. Uh, maybe one more, Paul, is there another one? Yeah, uh, John from Texas, you're the next one on the list. Are you able to join us with audio or I'm happy to read your response? Is that, does that work? Perfect. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, the folks I was talking to, uh, uh, we focused a little bit more on what would you change, right? And so so okay. uh, one, of the, one of the ladies I was speaking with, she was talking about the fact that the organization that she's working with uh, does not really have the, the resources ne necessary, the technological resources to be able to work from a distance and really uh, do her job effectively. Um, another uh, a woman I was speaking with was talking about the fact that uh, uh, her organization, the, the folks above her, I, you, you actually touched on it, Ruben, that, that uh, uh, the folks above her weren't really doing a very good job uh, of planning and being uh, contemplative uh, about their approach. And so that was creating problems for her as well. Um, I, I myself, I'm just hoping that we can have some, some patience from the clients that I work with. Yeah, yeah. And, and those are all things that, like you said, they're not ideal. And, and just a little bit of forethought, a little bit of planning can mitigate some of that. Now, you know, for example, if you don't have 
if you don't have the tools in place to work remotely, that, then oftentimes there's nothing you can do about that. You know, there are things that, you know, if you're at, if you're at an institution that is underfunded and you just don't have the ability to, to do things in an ideal way, there's not a lot you can do about that. But what you can do is you can communicate to the staff, listen, we're not holding you accountable for the fact that that's not in, in place, right? Um, and I think about my students. So, so my students, I'm, I'm the director of internships at, in my department and my interns regularly send me frantic emails. I'm not getting my hours because I'm not allowed to go to my site. I, what am I gonna do? I'm afraid I'm gonna fail. And I have to be the one to say to them, you don't have to worry at all. I realize you don't have the ability to go to your site. We will figure out a way. Here are the things that I want you to do to attempt to get some training and we will take care of it. You will be okay. And every time I do that, their level of anxiety comes down because even though they still don't have what they need, I'm letting them know that it's going to be okay. We will take care of them. Um, and so it's all in the approach. Uh, and there's, there's one more, I, in the interest of time, I want to make sure I'm respectful uh, of people's time, but in the chat, someone, posed a question that I think is interesting and I wanted to kind of paraphrase it and talk about it. They said, you know, they understand the idea of this finding the silver lining, finding the positives, but can that also trigger feelings of guilt because you can recognize that everyone doesn't have the resources you have, everyone doesn't have it as, as good as you have it. And that is absolutely the case uh, in fact, I find myself regularly saying, saying just that, you know, when someone says to me, so how are you managing this thing? I always say, well, listen, I recognize the privilege in my statements that I'm about to make, but I feel great. This is a lot of fun for me. I haven't lost income because I work at an institution where they allow me to work from home. Uh, and so the net result of this for me is more time at home with my family and less time running around working. And, and I recognize that there are people out in the world that don't have that. Uh, and, and, but with that, I also have to remember that whole serenity prayer thing, right? I cannot control the fact that everybody doesn't have my resources. And I can recognize that me having my resources does not take away anyone else's resources. You know, I'm not, I'm not living off of the backs of somebody else. And so me being okay in this moment actually doesn't make it so that somebody else isn't okay. In fact, me being okay makes it so that I can continue to provide teletherapy to my clients. Uh, if I weren't able to do that, if, if I weren't okay, I wouldn't be in a good state of mind to continue to help people. And so that allows me to put it in the proper perspective and recognize that me being in a good situation right now is actually not a problem. It in fact, in, in some way helps others because I have the bandwidth to help others. And so, Ruben, yes. If I can interrupt for just a second, I recognize it's one o'clock and some people need to dash off to other meetings. What we have done is stuck around for another 10 minutes or so, if you're willing to answer questions and to continue the conversation, if you're willing to do that. Um, but I just wanted to recognize and thank everyone that was able to join us today for carving out an hour of their time to be with us and join us in this conversation as we're really talking about how do we recharge ourselves and Ruben, I really appreciate the way that you framed this around locus of control, the way you framed it around stressors and what that means. We generally know stress is bad for us, but being able to put it into this language and this type of framing is really helpful for us to so one, ground us in our understanding of what's happening internally and from a management leadership position of recognizing what's happening within others and how do we bridge that empathy piece that comes along with our work to be able to understand that just because I might have this sense of contentment of this internal locus of control as you framed it, not everyone might be in that same situation. So how do I continue to challenge myself to thinking about how do I help others within my organization? Um, so thanks, Ruben. I'm gonna do my clapping of hands if I can figure out how to clap my hands uh, for you on behalf of all of us for joining us today. And if you're willing to stick on, uh, stick on for a few more minutes, if you will, as questions are coming in. Absolutely. I, I really appreciate you guys having me. Thanks uh, for, for being so involved and asking in, insightful and thoughtful questions. And I would love to answer a few more questions if they are here. Um, but thank you, Paul, for having me.